the next world exists. Because if our own lives at the very moment, this very moment, determined by our previous lives, then it must also be possible that our current lives are also determining our next life. On this, this is of course a topic that is difficult for people to understand. When we die from this world in the last moments of our life, all people in this world that have gone through such an experience have similar experiences. We, why do we know that? Did you ask them when they were dying? No, we didn't. But some people came back. And that is what we call near-death experiences. And many retreats that I've went on, I've asked people, has anyone in this room experienced a near-death experience or an outer body experience? Well, just near-death experience. Or did any of your relatives experience one, your friends? Almost always, every time, there is one person, or two persons that have experienced a near-death experience. But it's something that is not often talked about. Because we like to talk about chits and chit-chat, about peanut butter, about what program you've watched last night. We often do not tend to talk about death all day long. Anyone who does talk about death all day long usually doesn't have much friends, <laughs> unless you're a monk. So it's important for us to, to take a look at this. Near-death experience is actually very similar to many people all over the world. The first thing that people experience is what is called, in, in, as well as people who do research in this area, they call the, as in generally they call it your life flashing by. Right? People who do research in this area, they call it the life review. So be, just before you pass away, you see your life, all the things that you've done passing by. And many people experience also a feeling of a sort of universal causality, cause and effect operating. Uh, this is not Buddhist. These researches have been done mostly on people that are Buddhist. They say this, this, is, this is something they see, that there is this causality going on, that we experience suffering because of the deeds that we have done with a clouded mind and we experience happiness because of the things that we have done with a pure mind. So, they see these things happening. In the ancient text of Buddhism, in what is called the Apidama, or the parts of Buddhism, what is, you might call Buddhist science or something like that, the ancient text, on this, they say that before we pass away, we experience three things. Um, most these three things. First of all, we experience what is called, these three things are called alamana, or means objects of the mind. The first thing we see is kamma alamana, which means we see our own actions flashing by. As a result, we feel, might feel happy, we might feel disappointed. Depends on your actions. <laughs> Depends on your own actions, not someone else. And then, we might, some people might see what is called Kama, Kama Nimita Alamana, which means an image, images of the objects that you use in those actions. For example, you are someone who likes to give flowers to others, then you will see flowers. Or you like to give food to the monks, you see food, at the food that you offered or the utensils that you used. Or you are, you, if you are a butcher 
and you've slaughtered animals, then you see, you might see a knife or something like that. That is called Gamma Nimitta Alamana. Then there is the final image that occurs at that moment and is a result of the quality of our mind, the state of mind that we are at that moment. And that is the most important one for our future destiny, future destination, that is Kati Nimitta Alamana. Kati means destination. Nimitta means the sign. Alamana means object, as I mentioned. The object of mind that is the sign of destiny, of your destination. In other words, at this moment, and it is, this has been reported in many near-death experiences, people will either see a, an image that is an image black, dark, and confining, or they will see brightness, sometimes a gate, light, They might see beings in other planes, but we'll come back to that later. And at this moment, people then, at a certain moment, the human body is discarded completely. There is no connection anymore with the body. And then the person then there is a rebirth taking place. And the rebirth takes place exactly according to the state of mind and according to the image that occurred at that time. If the image that occurred or the, the sign of destiny at destination at the time was a positive sign of destination, then that person will go to a place of happiness, which we call a happy destination. Very, the Buddha used very simple words, sukati, or happy destination, very simple. If the mind is dark, clouded, it will go to an unhappy destination. So you can imagine that, suppose you see all your actions flash by, and most of them are not that good. It's very hard at that moment to freshen up your mind and say, oh, I'm okay with that, or something like that. This is not the sort of moment that you start to think like that. Your mind is very objectively seeing what you have done in that life. So your actions are very much your tools at that moment and determine your future. So, these things have been proven, have, people have found evidence for this in many near-death experience cases. Because near-death experience cases have been researched, thousands of them have been researched and done. And many of them have clear evidence that there is a mind going outside the body. And there is a mind that sees things going, appearing to that person. And the person will never act the same. person who has experienced a near-death experience will never be the same. This is evidence from all the studies we've done, which shows that if we, if we have knowledge about the afterlife, then that is very, has a great impact on our lives. So, the main point in talking about these three objects of mind that occur before we are, before rebirth takes place, is that our actions are the main cause. So if our actions have been positive, our mind is likely to be pure. 
and we are likely to be reborn in a positive place, in a place of happiness and a happy destination. But if our mind is impure because of the negative, destructive actions that we have done through our actions, physical actions, through our words, through our thoughts, then once we come to that final moment of life, our mind is very likely to be impure and we are going to a place that is a place of suffering, a destination that is unhappy, or what people might call a netherworld or a hell. So this is, this is some important thing. It's the quality of the mind that is important. We often know, we often study about the quality of many things around us, the quality of the things we buy, the quality of the things we eat, whether it's good quality or not. But we often do not realize or <clears throat> are aware of the quality of our own mind. Actually, our own mind has its quality. And that is exactly the quality that the Buddha developed when he attained enlightenment. And the Buddha, when he attained enlightenment, made the mind wieldy and malleable, made it soft and subtle. And that is the qualities, that is the quality of the mind, the good quality of the mind that, that made the Buddha attain finally was the, the precondition, the, the important requisite condition for him to attain enlightenment. Because the mind that is subtle, soft, and wieldy can be worked on. But if the mind is not, if the mind is impure, it cannot be worked on. And the mind that is still thinking about all the bad things we've done, still feels incomplete, feels in suffering, that mind cannot go to a good place. This is the law of karma. Karma is we sprung, karma is our relations. We will meet and go to places when we are reborn according to our karma. That is why the Buddha finally concluded about the law of karma that apart from the fact that we are the owners of karma, we are the heir to it. We have karma is the womb from which we sprung and karma is our relations. Most importantly, karma is our protection and refuge. Because it is karma, it is our deeds that we have done with a pure, impure mind that actually determine our future destination. But I, of course, I realize that this is not making myself popular, saying, stating such a traditional teaching. But this teaching is important and it has always been part of Buddhism. The Buddha, he never talked about these things just symbolically, but very clearly stated this. The Buddha, he never, if he talked about metaphors, he would just say it's a metaphor. He wouldn't talk about a metaphor and not say it is a metaphor. He would always be clear in his speech. He wasn't talking in riddles and, and vague speech, but he was a clear and to the point teacher. But it's important for us to realize that this is not a matter of membership, what religion you belong to, what nation you are from, what race you are from, or what race you belong to. But it's a matter of our actions. The law of karma is therefore not a, a personal matter of, I mean, it's not a matter of this person deserves that or that person deserves this because the law of, action, the law of karma doesn't look at, at the person, but it looks at the actions. The law of karma occurs because of actions. It doesn't occur because you deserve that or that person deserves that. So when someone is born poor because of never having given to others, it's not be that he's born poor and he deserves that. This is just the law of 
action operating, the law of karma. And that is a neutral law that doesn't look at what people deserve or not. And this is the law that the Buddha discovered. He didn't create it. On a similar note, we might be praying all our lives to go to a good destination after we die. But just praying won't have any effect. We might be praying all our lives. On the other hand, we might be praying all our lives to have our enemies go to a bad place after they die. But that won't have any effect as well. Because it's not because of praying that people go to heaven or go to hell or go to a good or a bad destination. But it's because of actions. Just like you have a great number of people holding a stone, throwing a big boulder into the water and then crying out, jumping around, don't sing, don't sing, don't sing, don't sing. The stone will think. It will always have to sink, even if you jump around that, that long, you cry out that strong. On a similar note, if you have oil in the water, and you throw oil in that water, and you say to the oil, sink, please sink to the bottom, sink to the bottom. Will the oil sink to the bottom? Because oil doesn't mix with water, so it will always be on the surface. So you cannot so these things are not determined by whether we are this religion or that religion, whether we are paid to this person or that person, but it determined, is all determined by our actions. That is why karma is our actual ref refuge. But of course we can learn from a good teacher about these things and then practice the, a good life. When we practice a good life, we will then receive the rewards of happiness and joy. Rewards that didn't, hasn't, didn't come because of that teacher created these rewards, but these rewards came because of the law of action, the law of karma. So this is very important for us to understand, to learn. Finally, we then are left with a couple of more items. The seventh item simply says in the text are, and the mother exists or the father exists. The meaning here is that we have, we owe to our parents. We owe to our mother, we owe to our father. What do we owe to them? It depends. If they have, if they have created this human body and they have taught us, and if they have taught us many good things, then we owe much to them. If they have taught us little, we owe little to them. It depends. But most importantly, we owe to them. Because our parents, if it wasn't for our parents, we wouldn't have been able to live this life as we have now. The Buddha, he compared the gratitude that we owe to our parents. He said it's very big, very large, very important. Just like he said, if we were to repay this gratitude by doing something back to them, if you just carry them on your shoulders for a hundred years and attend to all their needs, anoint them, massage them, rub them, all of that, and they might even actually, the text, the text actually say, they might actually <laughs> you know, excrement on, on you, uh, then it's still not enough to pay back the gratitude you owe to your parents. Because of, why? Because they have given this human life, given 
have brought us up and have raised us, have taken good care of our education and all that. Therefore, our parents, we owe a lot to them. There is a nice tradition in Japan that they have one Mother's Day and the people of Japan on that Mother's Day will all wear a rose. And any person that still, whose mother is still alive will wear, uh, I think it is a red rose. But any person whose mother has died will wear a white rose. So we can imagine that Mother's Day in Japan, everyone walking around with these roses. And if your, your rose is still there, you know, and it's still red, you're happy that your mother is still alive. You see many white roses but you're one still red. This is a very beautiful custom of the Japanese. Mm -hmm.